I'm the unofficial captain of choreography for my Taekwondo demonstration team back home. And as I stood in class the other day, listening to some of my teammates say how difficult it was to do my choreography on time, I told them, if you relax and listen to the music, it will tell you where to go. I'm not sure how much this slightly Gandalf-esque bit of advice helped anyone, but it did make me realize how integral music is in my personal cultural sphere. And not just mine, it's everywhere. On the bread aisle of Kroger, and over the panting breath of us running laps for a warm-up before demo practice. It's in all of our heads at some point during the week, our brains inexplicably hitting the play button on some earworm we picked up somewhere in the last decade or two. And it's embedded in the hobbit feet of Frodo and Sam running through the mines of Moria. Music is so much a part of our culture, I think in many ways we take it for granted. It's just there. We don't pick out the chords playing in the background of Lord of the Rings, we just see Hobbiton, the place, the feeling, the sense of wonder and emotion that the music evokes and instills into the scenes of lush green hills and round fairy tale doors built into the sides of them. Ones that you'd give anything to touch and push through under the perfect blue skies above. In a video essay on music in film, the nerd writer on YouTube called Howard Shore's score of Lord of the Rings an invisible layer of pure emotion that guides us, or challenges us, and that's as alive as the world Tolkien gave us. So alive that when I first watched the films, I felt as though what I was seeing was really happening in some parallel universe of hobbits, dwarves, and elves. And the score is invisible, indeed, to a point where we don't even really think about it until we see an essay picking it apart. But really, what would a movie be without a soundtrack? How deafening would the silence of the gym be without a 10-year-old radio hit playing in the background? What would an iPhone be without iTunes? So for me, and my Gandalf advice mentioned earlier, culture must equate music. I myself measure time, when I'm working on some art project, by album length. I have strong feelings on the Rolling Stones music rating system, biased as all hell. And when I choreograph, I do indeed let the music tell me what to do. I studied Eminem's lyrical style over Christmas break as a means of writing better poetry, and when Chester Bennington, the lead singer of Linkin Park, committed suicide last summer, I felt more than I had for any family member I had ever lost. The epics of my life, and I think for most of us, can be designated through the evolution of musical technology, the realm in which music inevitably lives. When I was a baby, long before I first heard Howard Shore's genius on screen, my mother played sing-along cassette tapes for me in the car when she ran errands around town. When I started kindergarten, I was dancing to All Star in jazz class every week, and my parents gave me Smash Mouth's Astro Lounge on CD, the first of my soon-to-be music collection, which, for a good many years mostly consisted of Disney soundtracks and Aaron Carter's only good album. I remember well the birthday when my parents gave me a purple and silver boombox of my own, I suppose because they were sick of me hogging theirs. A year later, I had made a holster for my little battery-powered CD player out of craft pot holders so I wouldn't be tied to a single location. In 2006, I started finding music on the brand new website YouTube, and my punk and alternative rock stage began in secret through earbuds and YouTube playlists. Though I suppose stage is the wrong word since I never fully grew out of it. I came to be on a first-name basis with all the members of Linkin Park who had been uploading vlogs, for lack of a better word to their own website since 2001, sharing everything with their street soldier fans, one of which I quickly became. By 2008, my music collection had grown to include all of Linkin Park's albums, stress on all, Paramore, Three Days Grace, and Green Day. And by the time Obama was first elected and Beyonce had become Sasha Fierce, all my Disney albums were shut away in a corner of my room where no judging eyes would ever find them. 
2010-ish, I found an iPod Nano under the Christmas tree and gladly traded it out with my CD player potholder combo, though I never stopped buying CDs. The backwardness of the anomaly that was 2016 ended up bringing some good. I added the first vinyl album into my collection and went to my first concert. 2017 brought the death of an era, but growth too as I boarded a plane for the first time to celebrate life with my street soldier family in Los Angeles, where I felt the pounding heartbeat of music through my souls as tears streaked down my cheeks and the cheeks of 17,500 others screaming all around me for a man who had built for all of us a place to belong. As I grew up, music and its home of technology grew with me, guiding me through youth and into adulthood, just as Howard Shore's masterful score guided me through Tolkien's Middle Earth, from Hobbiton to the great peaks of Mordor. The music challenged me too when I learned the man who first made me feel human had hung himself because he never could. Whether the sound pulses from vinyl, cassette, compact disc, mp3 files, or the massive speakers on either side of the live stage, it remains, in the nerd writer's words, an invisible layer of pure emotion that guides us, challenges us. Perhaps not for everyone on the same level, but I think in some way all of us experience this odd, symbiotic relationship between music and listener to some degree. It challenged us, fueling flames as we entered our emo or goth or rebellious teenager phases. It forced growth when we first found the one song that reminded us of someone long lost, and we hit repeat until our tears had dried up and our hearts had learned to stitch themselves back together. Music guides, challenges, and above all, it has built from silence a world that's as alive as the world Tolkien gave us.